There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country, and there is no escaping it, no matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. It's a new week and you're tuned in to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. Tim is a little under the weather. He may join us for Supernatural News a little bit later, but we're going to do a little parish here. I have a, a special guest and a friend of our show joining us right now. Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer and psychic explorer, is a world-renowned fourth-generation science-based evidential psychic medium that communicates with spirits. He has been featured on TV shows, news shows, radio shows, magazines, books. He's got two award-winning books out on the market right now. He's been one of our, our favorite guests over the years, and he's back with us today. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. It's great. It's always great being on Darkness Radio. Well, thank you. We always love having you here. Um, and again, we're going to put up a link to Mark's website. So if you want to find Mark's books, you want to get readings with Mark, all that information is on his site and available for you. Uh, I thought it'd be fun today, Mark, to spend a little time with you in our Parish Share segment. Usually we start with some supernatural news, but since we're giving Tim a little time to see if he can feel better and, and maybe join us for supernatural news in a bit, why don't we go into Parish Share? I'm going to share some of these stories people have been sending in to me. Uh, we're going to go back to more recent stories. And, um, I, I, you know, just feel free to weigh in with me on, on any of these on what you think they're dealing with. Is it real? Is it ghost? Is it imagination? Because I know... And what I love so much about you is you are kind of a science-based psychic medium, which to a lot of our listeners is going to make them scratch their head, right? They they think, well, how the hell can a medium, a psychic, consider himself science-based? Is that just a selling tool? Try to explain to listeners who might be new and unfamiliar with you at this point what you mean by that. Well, people tend to think that spirituality and science are in two separate camps. But for those of us who study it as a science, what we're seeing, Dave, is everything is based on quantum physics. In other words, that we, we all know that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. And so when people die, the electromagnetic field in your head, which um, – I refer to it as your quantum consciousness, and that's what uh, physicists refer to it. In psychology, they refer to it as consciousness, and in matters of faith, the spirit or soul does not disintegrate or fall apart. It's transferred to another realm, and by aligning my brainwave frequencies to a higher level and spirits bringing theirs down to, to align with mine, that's how we communicate, so that everything in creation – in the, this universe and the multiverses is all um, connected electromagnetically. And this is not some woohoo thing. This is science. This is what Tesla said, Einstein, Carl Sagan, and, and hosts of physicists all over the world. So that, in a nutshell, is what being a science-based psychic medium is. And you also are what's known as an evidential um Medium. Talk to me about that real quickly because I want people as we're reading these stories and when you're weighing in, I want newer listeners again to have a, a context to why we like working with you and what that means. Being an attorney and being a medium both revolve upon evidence. Once again, people think, well, how can you possibly be a lawyer and a psychic medium? And it's like, how can you possibly approach either field without evidence? Lawyers don't win their cases without evidence and the law and the facts to back them up. And a medium has no credibility if all they do is give you fluff, substanceless messages that aren't backed up by details to verify the identity of the spirit. 
spirit. So if I'm communicating with a spirit, I have to bring forth evidence, um, maybe what they look like, uh, specifics on what they died from, not just their heart stopped, because like obviously everybody's heart stops, but what happened to them, shared memories between you and that person, their name, uh, the dates, like you know, date of birth, uh, when they passed, significant things. Uh, for example, you'll, you'll find this, I think this is a good one to share with the Army of Darkness. I'm doing a reading for this woman. Her, the spirit of her son comes through. And he starts showing me jars and jars of pickles. And I'm like, pickles? Does that make any sense? No. I go, are you sure? Pickles? No. So so he wouldn't let me go. I mean, Dave, it's like my head was filled with images of jars and barrels and buckets of pickles. And finally she says, well, that makes absolutely no sense. But, okay, there, there's the but. I said, but what? She said, well, after he died, I moved, and now I live across the street from a pickle canning facility. But that has uh, that doesn't make any sense at all. And it's like, yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Well, he didn't know that. I go, ma'am, I just don't throw out random condiments hoping I get a hit. Okay, you live across the street from a pickle factory. Your son's letting you know he knows this. No, that doesn't make any sense. How would he know that? Because he's a spirit. Well, how would he know that? So finally, thank goodness, her brother was there. He goes, you know, he goes, you live across the street from a pickle factory. This guy doesn't know that, but your son does. Oh, Okay, so <laughs> normally you don't have to fight with people <laughs> over, over things like that. And the thing is, she was just nervous, and then she turned around, and she was a very sweet lady. But but that's that's an example of of evidential mediumship, and I think that one's hilarious. So I had to share it. I love it. Yeah, it's it's strange to uh, watch people get readings sometimes, and how how they will fight information and i'll tell a quick story i've mentioned about chris fleming at a, an event i saw him in, in vegas he was doing this kind of seance and he starts tapping into this he's like i've uh, you know i'm seeing like a, a an a-frame house with a, an entire glass front this is really weird who'd have an a-frame house with a glass front and nobody's responding he goes and I, you know I, I see the guys either he's doing the swinging motion so he's either like a golf pro or a tennis pro nobody's responding and there's like over a hundred people in this room he goes then I see it looks like either like a duck or a big goose, but it's not wild. It's like a pet. It's like a pet goose named uh, Willie or something. Willie or and no answer, nothing. And he's breaking a sweat. You could just see the poor guy is getting flop sweat and stage fright, right? Because nobody's responding out of this. And when you're the big draw for that night, psychic meet him in your first reading, nothing's coming through. He goes, "All right, well, I'm sorry. I, you're obviously not here for somebody." in this room so i'm gonna let you go and then he tried to explain sometimes you know that we're in a big hotel maybe a ghost from another person or from the hotel is there you know which to the outside world sounds like plausible deniability right i mean you could you could oh yeah sure that's exactly what it is chris it goes quiet as he's trying to tap into the next ghost and the girl two over from me i hear her lean over to her friend she goes that's really weird she goes i wasn't sure if that message was for me or not i mean I had an uncle who had an A-frame house with a glass front, and for my 10th birthday, he gave me a goose, but the goose's name was Billy, not Willie. Oh, great. And I go, yeah. and, then, and then she says something about him being a tennis pro, and I go, hold on, really loud, and Chris sits up and goes, what? What's going on? And I go, hold on. I said, Chris, a woman two over from me just said she's not sure if that last message was for her or not because she had an uncle that was a tennis pro that owned an A-frame house with a glass front, but he gave her a goose named Billy, not Willie. And he just laughed and shook his head. He goes, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. goes, How much more specific can I get? But because the name was off, she every other piece of the detail, she just didn't want to draw attention to herself. She didn't want to embarrass herself if she was wrong. And I was like... Oh my God! Oh, I get that that all the time at events. People don't raise their hand. You give like a list of ten things, right on point. Then afterwards, they come up and go, "Oh, that was for me," but I didn't think I should raise my hand. And um, <laughs> you know, it's it's great. Well, there was something really. Um, I was in, in Central Florida and I was doing a reading, and I kept seeing the spirit of um, a little girl, and I saw a deterioration in like this wire mesh over her face. And and suddenly, um, I was getting all these details, and this guy stands up, and he's shaking. And he said, I found Kaylee Anthony's body. 
No. And all of a, yeah. And all of a sudden, it's like I, I looked at him and go, "Oh my God!" He was in the back. I couldn't see him. And I remember him on news, on the news, and the, the wire mesh was the duct tape on her face. And I said, "I'm feeling a deterioration." The little girl laying in, in like muck or water. And what had happened was he was a, a meter reader, and he was driving in his truck, and he um, pulled over because he had to take a leak. Pardon my language, but he did. <laughs> and, and so he's taking a whiz there, and all of a sudden he smells something and he walks over and he sees these skeletal remains calls the police he's initially the suspect they arrest him then they find out that he didn't do it but he was the one that found kaylee anthony's body and she came through and gave a number of messages to him one which was really intense which was you are braver than my daddy ever was and i've, I've always wondered um how much the anthony family knew about about what Casey Anthony did to her daughter, and I have, I have no doubt that that she killed her. Um, it seems like it could have been accidental, but it was pretty intense. So things like that happened, and I was very appreciative that this gentleman had the nerve to stand up and and. Uh, and it was him because I remember I mean, my brother was there that night. He goes, oh, my God, I remember seeing that guy on TV and because uh, it was a real big deal here in uh, central Florida. So things like that happen. And, and for the listeners out there, and, Dave, i got to tell you this. One of the things that I love about being on your show is everywhere I go, whether it's New England, California, Seattle, Arizona, Texas, I mean, you name it. At every one of my events, at the book signings, people come up to me, and I will always get at least three or four Army of Darkness people. They say, I'm a member of the Army of Darkness, and I, I like listening to the show. So I, I can't thank you enough um, to have having me back on. Oh, it's always a pleasure. Let's uh, We'll dip into some emails here and get rolling. I want you to weigh in on some of these. The other day we talked about this on our show, and um, Mike sends in an email. He says, on Friday's program, you asked the guest, why do old bones need guarding? Because we were talking about this uh, Bell Witch Cave and that there was heavily uh, saturated area of Native American burial mounds and grounds. And I've, I've thought, why would, if we've moved on to some special location, we've gone to heaven or Valhalla or wherever we end up, or we're reincarnated, what do we care if our bones get disturbed 200, 300 years later? And in some Native American cultures, they say it's, the warrior spirit that was left to guard that area that that acts up or it is an elemental that was part of the tribe's grouping or or guide whatever you want to call it that acts up and we were, we were kind of discussing that the email goes on to say um friday program you asked the guest why do old bones need guarding it immediately occurred to me that if there are portals inside burial mounds the manifesting spirit could be there as a guide or maybe a bit of both um guide or guard as needed regarding the stolen skull how is it that science has many skulls of many different cultures that don't seem to create any problems at their lab or museum interesting i visited a home last summer filled with lots of curiosity including a real human skeleton the sort used for medical instruction it would seem that uh, that they could have had a lot of problems with it now in that case when people give their body to science i think their soul is already aware why would they hang around with their bones Right. They they don't. Uh, they don't. I think that this is more of a cultural respect. Um, we, we should have respect for, for the bodies of people who've been deceased. But as far as a spirit hanging around the bones, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. Now, on the other hand. Somebody thought it would be fun to give me for my birthday a couple years ago tickets to um, this mummy exhibit. And it wasn't just Egyptian mummies. It was uh, all the way up until like the 20th century, people whose bodies had been preserved. And so I'm walking around looking at them, and all of a sudden I'm getting these very – and I know when I'm picking up on, on uh, the presence of spirits. And the one that really got me was this baby – from like it was uh, probably the, the 1850s it was uh, the, the child of some Austrian noble uh, and there's some teenagers that are making fun of it saying it looked like Chucky and all that and you know I could see the ha ha factor but I remember looking at them saying this was somebody's baby and the kids I like, kind of backed off because I could feel the presence what I think Dave 
is that certain areas, everything's frequency, everything's vibration. And areas where people have died, um, there is a sacred um, sensation to this. And when you go to a place like uh, Bell Witch Cave, which is really cool, and if you haven't been, you know, definitely go, um, when you start focusing on, wow, this is a burial site. This is what I call a frequency beacon. And this is where we're sending out an emission of frequency and the spirits that are associated with either those bodies or that area pick up on it and they will immediately come to it. Because from what we can tell, we meaning those of us who study spirituality as a science, that spirits are not only pure energy, but being in the electromagnetic spectrum, they move at the speed of light. So they may not be hanging out at Bell Witch Cave all the time, but if somebody starts thinking about it or focusing on it, it's going to draw people to them. It's a lot like when I um, when I was a teenager and I went to Dachau concentration camp in in uh, just outside of Munich, Germany. And, you know, I was, I was a teenager and, you know, I've been with my friends the night before and, you know, you could drink and, and we were a bit hungover and partying. And so we get to Dachau and, and we're walking around and all of a sudden I start getting all the cold chills and tingles up my spine. And I see that now I am surrounded by what look like hundreds, if not more, of these people in, in, uh, prison garb with the, the white and black stripes and they had this sunken, emaciated faces and the horror in their eyes and the screaming and I flipped out I mean I started crying and I went down on my knees and I was shaking and you know all my college friends like dude what's your problem you know and and a friend of mine that uh, actually grew up uh, a couple streets away from me he 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 knew about me you know me being being a psychic and he knew about my family and I remember he came over and he like stuck his hand right underneath my armpit pulled me up my feet goes all right dude we're getting out of here and he goes, he's hungover, had too much drink, got me out of there, got me in a taxi. He goes, dude, I don't know what happened to you, but you needed to get out of there. So I can say that, oh, spirits don't hang out in a particular place. There's no hauntings. On the other hand, there's something about certain places, vibrationally or when people focus on it, that it draws spirits to it. So they may not be there 24-7, but they will reconnect with a particular location for various reasons. See, that's <clears throat> that's disarming to me. Again, I, you know, so many of us that grew up in the Christian faith, you know, and, and in most of these religions, they all share the feeling that this is just a, a, a temporary vessel for us. The next level, the next evolution is the important thing. And that we, we give up that mindset of materialism. But yet... There are these cases where these beings come back, it seems, to, you know, haunt or, or protect or act in certain ways. And doesn't it seem counterintuitive to you that that would be – It wouldn't that energy spent be spent better just enjoying the next evolution, the next life? Because it's, Well, they do. They, 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 I, I, I'm sorry, David. I mean – No, no problem. Go ahead. Uh, they absolutely do enjoy being on the other side. We also have to realize that we are trying to understand something, meaning spirits, on the basis of our perception and what we know, which is very normal. We perceive things by through sight, smell, taste, touch, sound, you know, the five physical senses. Um, we also classify things on the basis of what we understand. You and I do not know what it is like, or at least we don't remember what it is like to be pure energy and move at light speed. So these spirits can zip in, and in their reckoning, the time that they spend there with us would be a fraction of a second, and then they zip back to this higher frequency of the other side. So what we perceive is like, you know, there's castles in, in Britain that you know, supposedly have been uh, haunted for five, six hundred years or whatever, you know, but in a spirit's reckoning, that would be for you and I maybe three seconds because of the timelessness of time and the perception of time. So I don't think that they're imprisoned there or they're stuck there, but for whatever reason, they want to go back and see why people are vibing them, you know, why people are putting that frequency into them. I think it's interesting. You also brought up a very fascinating point, Dave, about an elemental. And 
elementals, you know, you can call them fairies, pixies, sprites, leprechauns, and people giggle when, you know, you say things like that. But uh, various cultures actually um, believe in, in these these spiritual entities, and you can call it whatever you want, but they're spirits that are li- aligned with the frequency of non-human things. It could be plants, it could be animals, maybe even minerals, and they resonate and focus on those areas, and people will pick up on their energy signatures, get the cold chills, the tingles, the sensation of the presence of a, a non-human intelligence and uh, tend to say, oh my gosh, it's demonic because I don't understand it, therefore I fear it, therefore it's evil. So so there's a lot. And I remember when we were at the Stanley doing uh, uh, paranormal investigations, they were picking up on elementals right and left over there. So so there are certain areas that just seems to be stronger with the force than, than others. <laughs> I like that, stronger with the force. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's go to this email. Hey, Dave and Tim, I was listening to your podcast about ghost crimes. I have two stories I'd like to share with you. I'm a CNA, and is that what? A certified nurse's assistant, I believe. I've been a CNA for six years. I worked at a nursing home where these stories occurred. The first one is short and sweet. On my floor, we had a room that we absolutely never put any resident in because days after they would be admitted, no matter what they were being admitted for, they would pass away. So we stopped putting residents in that room. I normally either work the morning or evening shift. I was working an evening shift one day, and I was assigned uh, to the side with the death room. I had no problem with the room. uh, All I had no problem with the room all shift. I got all my residents showered, shaved, fed, changed, and comfy in bed. I sat at the nurses' station to give report and do my charting. At the nurse's station, we have a light-up board that tells us if a call light goes off and what room it is. So I'm sitting there, and the light-up board starts sounding and telling me that a call light was pulled. I look at the board, and it's the death room. So I'm like, okay, maybe faulty wiring. I don't know. So I go to the room and open the door, walk over, turn the light, turn the call light off like normal, and then head back to finish the paperwork. About 10 minutes later, the light goes off again. So I write a note to the maintenance man to take a look when he gets a chance. I walk down the hall to turn it off again, only to find that the door I just went through 10 minutes ago was locked. I called the maintenance man. He came, turned it off manually from the light board, and I told him that the door was locked. But he said, yes, we always keep it locked. We don't want anyone wandering in there. Then I felt my face grow pale. He asked what was wrong, and I told him, I was just able to walk right into that room 10 minutes before. He said, I don't know how. We always keep that room locked. Now, before we go on to our next story, what do you make of that? First of all, a room where no matter what kind of um, health condition the person is put in there, they die shortly after. I mean, could are there really things, energies like that that could kill us? I don't know. And I don't know if anyone could possibly answer that question. I know the spooky crowd's immediately going to go, oh, yes, it's some negative thing. And then the religious crowd may talk about the angel of death. It may also be that, and I'm a firm believer that there's a time we're going to be born and a time we're going to die. And, and it may be that people that are put in that room, that's the day and the time they're supposed to die. And this may be a synchronistic event, which is not – a chance or or coincidental um, occurrence, but really a complex series of events maneuvered by spiritual influences to put the person there so that they can transition. So that's another way of looking at it. But as far as a malevolent spirit that goes around killing people, I think that you know that that goes along with the boogeyman and and a lot of you know, Krampus and <laughs> things like that. I, yeah, yeah, that bothers me. But, you know, I guess this is one thought, right? If you have some kind of, I, I don't like to use the word vortex, throw it around too easily, but if there's some kind of vortex there or there's a, a negative energy there, if somebody's already weak and feeble, older, sick, even if they don't have what would normally be something that would kill them, if you put them into a room in close proximity, theoretically, could it draw the energy from the person? Not like it's malevolently trying to kill the person. But could it just be that it's so draining that it just kind of helps to snuff out the life force? Well, it could also be that that person was supposed to die, and that's where they're in, 
quote unquote, the right place at the right time. And many people, when something horrible happens to them, they feel that they are in the wrong place at the wrong time, but perhaps that's where they were supposed to be. Because as we all know, um, life is not a bucket full of cherries where everything's happy all the time and terrible things or what we perceive to be negative and terrible things happen to all of us. Um, and they're, they're painful and they're excruciating. But it, the cold hard fact of life is that our material world existence, our physical life is going to end. And it's going to end at a particular time and a particular place. And it just may be that this is where these people are supposed to leave. And so, of course, people put a stigma. Other people may look at that instead of an evil or negative vortex as a quote-unquote stairway to heaven as well. So maybe it is a blessed event that people that, gee, maybe they didn't have a life-threatening condition, but they did die. But there is a logical explanation for everything, and that logic all comes back to physics. So those people may have been in a weakened state and from a, a preliminary analysis and not have been uh, in a life-threatening condition, but the fact is something was going on within their body where they were going to die, and this just happened to be the location where they were, and ergo, it was their stairway to heaven as opposed to, oh, the boogeyman came and got them. You know, it's, it's my mom had a very similar story working at Shriners Children's Hospital in Chicago. And now that she's passed, I think I can say that without, you know, uh, getting her in any trouble here. But she said that they had a little girl that uh, they all loved her to death. She was such a sweetie, but she was constantly riding that nurse button. And she passed away in that room. And they kept the room empty for a few days, but that light kept going on and off. And she'd have to go in there and turn it back off again and come back out. And a few minutes later, go back on. So she finally went in there and just addressed her. And she's like, honey... You need to go now. It's time for you to go away and go to the light. We love you and we miss you and we're sorry that we lost you, but it's time for you to go now. And she went back and that light never went back on again. Super. So, and see, yeah. Well, your, well, your mom, and, and for the benefit of the listeners who, who don't know, I, I had the privilege of knowing Dave's mom. Um, I got to know her, met her a couple times, and she and I just clicked right away. She was the coolest lady. but And she was also very, very spiritual and spiritually sensitive. And so in, in an environment like that, she felt uh, the, the quantum energy of the girl's spirit around. And was the girl hanging out there, or was the girl wanting to say to your mom that I exist and let my family know, which is why your mom would have said, message received. You know, it's like, Roger that, Roger that, you know, now you can. Uh, transition. So, so you know, there, there's different ways of looking at this. I always try to, in a, in a spiritual situation, look at it objectively instead of diving into the pool of negativity and diving in the pool of angels and bunnies and unicorns. Um, you know, be, let's look at what the situation is, what happened. Um, yeah, death hurts. Um, you know, I lost my dad recently, uh, and and even though I'm a psychic medium, and even though I was there when he passed, and and from all intents and purposes, it was a beautiful thing. Um, it still hurts, and it hurts real bad. But but those of us like Dave, like Dave's mom, like my dad, and and my family, we know that material world life is just part of our existence. It's an infinitesimal fraction of it. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing aspect of that. And it was fun when mom was alive to tell me a lot of these stories regarding the nurses and how they would deal with some of the supernatural occurrences that would t- take place at the hospital. And I guess there were a lot. So that, you know, when mom would have those moments where she wasn't sure if she believed in all these things of the paranormal, all of a sudden something like that would occur. And she said, you know, you could say it was faulty wiring, but why did the faulty wiring stop the minute I addressed it and said it's time for you to move on? Oh, sure. Right. And I think that that, once again, spirits being quantum electromagnetic energy, they're able to influence electrical fields. And, um, I mean, I've, I've run into several instance, instances of this, uh, acknowledging with clients and myself observing where somebody has died in a particular place or you're vibing, thinking about a person, the lights start flickering. Um, and, and that's the, their energy field, they, they're able to influence others. I mean, after my, my mom passed, her best friend kept getting a phone call from my mom's telephone number and a telephone number that had been disconnected. Okay? And, and what's cool about my mom's friend, she's also a medium, and she goes, oh, I knew that was Jean calling. So, 
So this is not an unusual occurrence, and this is once again getting into fact and evidence based. Okay, that's not a coincidence. That spirit was making contact with your mom. Your mom acknowledged the contact, and once the spirit was um, assured that your mom got it, then she felt no longer the need to influence the electrical fields, in other words, flashing the lights. All right, let's. Uh, here's the second part of this email. It says, uh, my next one is the one that really shook me to my core. I had a very sweet German lady as one of my residents for a while before she passed. We're not supposed to have favorites, but every CNA secretly has a favorite. Mine was this lady. Her nickname was Goo Goo. She lost all function of her legs, so she needed total care. She loved when I sang her to sleep, so she would always be my last resident I put to bed. She shared a room with another woman who was bedridden. Now, this room was split with CNAs, as uh, well, the other girl working the floor with me had the lady closest to the door, and Goo Goo was my resident. I put all my residents to bed and had goo goo in bed and i sang to her to sleep after she went to sleep i went and did my usual write-up report for the next shift and chart every 30 or so minutes i just walk the halls and check everyone not just my residents but all the residents on my floor so i do a walk through everything is fine a few people needing water and whatnot but it's so i go back to finish my charting another 30 minutes go by and i go to do another walk through everything seems fine until i get to gugu's room i look into her room and gugu had completely moved her head and was now where her feet should have been and her feet were where her head should have been she's staring just above the door frame and speaking what i thought was german i grabbed our german speaking nurse and she said i don't know what she's saying at this point, Gugu is completely freaking out, shouting, and we don't know what language she's speaking in. She wouldn't even respond to the German nurse speaking German or me. She eventually calmed down, and the nurse asked why I put her in bed like that. I told her I didn't. When I did my walkthrough, that's how I found her, which is physically impossible for her. We never figured out what language Gugu was speaking or how she completely turned around in the bed like that. Those are just a few of the stories I have for now, but I'm sure I'll have more. Well, thank you, Jackie. We appreciate you sharing your tales with us. That's a creepy one. Holy cow, the woman who's bedridden, unable to move, flip-flops from one end of the bed to the other and starts speaking in tongues, Mark. Ooh, that's a cool one. Um, <laughs> I, <I'd> like to- <laughs> your excitement think- level's much higher than mine is on that. Well, I, I'd like to get a, a background, and, and obviously we don't have that, um, on the woman, her heritage, and and her history, to know if she, throughout her life, if Gugu had actually um, been spiritually sensitive. Because what this sounds like to me, you know, in, in all these cases that we've talked about over the years, Dave, and uh, like with demonic possession and things like that, I've always, I've always been in the camp that there is no demonic possession. However... There are people who are trans mediums, that's what they're called in Britain, and in the U.S. they're referred to as channelers, like Edgar Casey, okay, like the, the Abraham Hicks folks and, and some others, where what happens is, is a spirit will temporarily take use of their body. And this is what that sounds like to me. And the spirit can um, do things and generate energy to, like, you know, juxtapose uh, the, the position of the body. And then also that's where the speaking of unusual languages comes out because there have been instances where people, words were coming out of their mouth that didn't correlate with any current language, that they had been perhaps Aramaic or maybe she was speaking some type of de-evolved German or or some Viking dialect. I mean, who knows? I mean, and, and also, you know, uh, with all due respect to the person sending in the emails, you know, we got to make sure this isn't some nut making up stories uh, to, to try to shake our cage. But but let's assume for the for the sake of discussion that it's legit. This could be a trans mediumship um, a situation, and I have seen trans mediums, legitimate ones who start um, when spirits come through their bodies, and it's in full light. It's none of this nonsense where you're in the dark, tied up with rock and roll blaring, so it covers up the sound of the helpers moving people around. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> that's another story altogether. But um, what 
what that would indicate, what, what, I, what I saw with the trans mediums is the structure of their face change. I saw a woman and it looked like, um, like the shadow of a beard formed on her face and a male voice began to come out of her. And it wasn't all this. It, the problem I have with a lot of these trans mediums is they all tend to talk in these goofy Irish and British accents and all they ever say is, well, like attracts like and you have to figure it out. It's all this really vague fortune cookie philosophy. Um, but but uh, what I saw in Britain is people giving facts, figures, data, true information. And this is what I would say if this Goo Goo case is legitimate and accurately described, this would be more of a trans mediumship channeling. And maybe Goo Goo didn't even know she was a channel or the fact that she was in a depleted state mentally, she was a wide open channel where a spirit would easily be able to take use of her body and not necessarily for malevolent purposes. Could have been trying to make contact and and unfortunately, nobody spoke ancient Viking. All right, we're back. This is the best in paranormal talk radio beyond the darkness. Parish Air Monday, Supernatural News. Right now, we've got our good friend Mark Anthony with us. You can check out his website, evidenceofeternity.com. We'll have a link up to that so you can find it more readily. And if you'd like to pick up his books or you'd like to get a reading with Mark, you can certainly reach out to him through his website. I will tell you this. There are very few mediums that we truly endorse as gifted and special, Mark Anthony is among the top. So I, I, if you're looking for that special reading, you want to make that connection. Mark Anthony is the guy to go to on this. So, uh, again, check out evidenceofeternity.com for more information. All right, let's get back into a couple more emails here before we roll into some supernatural news. Dave, I was listening to your show requesting medical personnel to send in some stories. So here's mine. I work at a hospital and uh, have been there for some years now. Most of the staff will talk about weird things that have happened to them or have happened to patients staying at the hospital. For me, the only thing I experienced was voices in empty rooms and doors opening or closing unexplainably until about six months ago. I was working on the uh, floor assigned to me that day. As usual, standing outside of a patient's room, gathering their medications and waiting for my computer to load. Nothing I haven't done tons of times before. While waiting, I looked up and almost knew exactly where to point my gaze. I looked towards an opposite hallway where more patient rooms were located. I saw this man coming out of a room, pushing an IV pole, looking dazed and confused. I remember that look he had, like someone completely unaware of where they were. I even had that urge to ask him if he needed help. Maybe he had gotten out of bed and he wasn't supposed to or needed something. As I was thinking these things, the man was looking all around when I saw that he didn't have any legs. He was floating, like gliding across the floor. I didn't even have a moment to process something. As I was thinking these things, the man was looking all around. When I saw he didn't have any legs and uh, floating down the hall, I heard a voice as clear as day right by my ear saying, Look down. Don't let him see that you can see him. Immediately, I looked down at the medications on my computer and stayed there for a moment. Can't really explain how I didn't even notice the voice I'd heard. I was standing there all alone. No one behind me or next to me. The patient in the room was nonverbal. I just knew I had to listen to what that voice said. Such warning in that voice, I did not even think to question it. After a few minutes, two or three, I looked up and the man was gone. I looked around to see if there was anyone around. The man with no legs had just disappeared. I know that voice I heard was someone trying to protect me. From what, I don't know, but I'm glad I'll never find out. P.S. I never told anyone at work about this and that comes from um well we'll keep her name anonymous i'm not sure if she wants us to mention it since she's still working there uh but mark okay let's tackle a few questions on this all right okay first of all uh the spirits walking down the hole holding a ghostly iv pole as well now doesn't that seem strange to you i mean i would think if the spirit has left the body it would get up and walk down the hall maybe lost and confused but the iv pole how do you explain that not unusual. Um, when spirits come through, they will often appear very much like they did prior to passing. So for an experienced medium, that person uh, describing this had a mediumistic experience. Not everyone's a medium. 
but everyone is capable of a mediumistic experience. So if I've been doing a reading and I saw that, what that would indicate to me is that the person was very sick in the hospital, um, most likely bedridden, declining, and having IVs uh, being administered to them. So there's, uh, first off, you have the gender, appearance, um, um, a very sick physical condition, and then the specificity of an IV. So it's actually, that was a pretty cool experience that, that uh, she she uh, had. Okay, next question. All right. Now, we've heard from different um, paranormal experts, and I use that term loosely again because I know it's hard to be an expert at something that we don't really know full answers on. But if you see only partial versions of ghosts that we've been told a lot of times that's more of a demonic force that it's not able to fully realize itself and that's why we'll see it from just knees up or you know it looks distorted or one arm is twisted and you know bent up like a claw or something weird like that what do you believe on that is it's just that's all the energy the spirit has it can only manifest part of itself Oh, welcome to the dark ages. If we don't understand it immediately, it's got to be demonic. We must fear it and persecute it. Yes. <laughs> um, no, she was just picking up on the image of the spirit. And when you work with them, because a lot of times when they appear to me and I see them in my mind, so I, and sometimes I see them in the room, um, they're not all there. Okay, so it's it's an energy thing and a building. So, of course, the people who don't understand the phenomenon yet are able to perceive it, the the boogie woogie crowd in in the mediumistic field. Oh, it's demonic because it didn't appear. I mean, listen to their explanation. It's ridiculous. Okay, spirits are pure quantum electromagnetic energy. We're all electromagnetic energy, and we're all tethered, and we're all at the subatomic level created at the same basic unit of quanta. And as Einstein said, there is no matter. There's just energy which vibrates at different frequencies. This is not philosophy. This is physics. So this person was picking up on the energy of a um, of a spirit who, like, either returned or had just you know recently died, and the fact that didn't see the legs, big deal. Okay, they got other factors uh, with it because spirits don't have bodies. And this is where I depart with a lot of my colleagues. Oh, they have a spirit body. No, they don't. They are pure energy. And what they do is they emit waves of frequency that our brains pick up on. And within those waves of frequency, there is intelligence and in, in, in like encoded information that our brain takes and then um, translates into recognizable images, feelings, sensations based on our cultural references. So basically, the person seeing this got like 70% of, of the information, at least the, the physical characteristics and cause of death being transmitted. The fact that she didn't see his feet and he was wearing little blue fuzzy slippers doesn't really matter in this particular context. What about the fact that there's this warning voice in her ear, look down, don't let him see that you can see him. What do you think that was all about? I think that's her own fear, um, her inner self. And of course, she'll say it was the voice that she hears that is not the one she normally hears in her head. But on the other hand, it could have been, quote unquote, one of her guides on the spirits that's around us to say, like, if you engage him and he is aware that you can see them, it's not going to be like, ah, here I come. <laughs> you know, it may, <laughs> it may be more that she wouldn't know what to do. Okay, and it may have been too overwhelming for her. So I tend to think that it's either one, her own um, um, brain telling her this, or number two, um, her higher self, or number three, one of her guides is telling her just don't engage because you won't know how to deal with it, as opposed to next thing you know, you know, he's going to be, you know, making your ashtrays fly around your house or whatever um so so yeah sometimes you get these like don't engage it because you aren't prepared to handle it all right so that's it just your your inner guide if you will maybe just yeah. trying to help you on how to perceive this and deal with it well three days before my father died um, I went, uh, he, we, we kept him at his house. We had the hospice bed set up in his living room. We didn't want him dying in a facility. Right. And I walked in the room and I heard a voice in my head that said, death is upon him. And it wasn't my voice. And he was gone like less than, than, uh, two and a half days later. Okay. And so we all receive these messages and I did not like that message. Uh, let me tell you, I, I really didn't want to hear that. Um, and then when it was, you know, when he did transition, I knew that that was that was um, 
my guides, my inner self, um, basically my connection with the with God, with the higher energy telling me this. So she just may have been, don't let him see that because then he's going to be drawn to you and try to communicate and she may not know what to do and it could have caused her to panic or maybe her guides are looking out for her because if she went around going, I saw this guy and he was floating down this and the next thing you know she's unemployed. So there could be practical reasons why her guides were shielding her as opposed to you know, hey, he's going to turn into a guy the IV is going to turn into a pitchfork and next thing you know we're going to be living in some dark ages, you know, pre-enlightenment <laughs> fantasy of the afterlife. Now you- <laughs> You're very dismissive of the Dark Ages uh, mentality of, of the malevolence, but do you believe that there are dark spirits and dark energy, even demonic? No. Um, I believe that there's positive and negative energy, but I don't believe that Lucifer, a central command of evil, exists. And let me tell you, Dave, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and oh, as far as they were concerned, you know, uh, there was a demonic entity that probably looked a whole lot like Christopher Lee, you know, running around, you know, causing all this. But what I've come to learn is that the the evil in this world is caused by the human ego. It's um, when we're acting in a completely self-centered manner. I know that when I've done um, nasty or rotten things to other people, um, and I'm, I, I always feel bad and apologize a million times after you know I hurt somebody's feelings um, because I know better. But but when when uh, you act in a completely self centered manner, that's what the devil is. We don't need some uh, central command of evil. Now there are spirits that are not necessarily aligned with human beings, with the elementals we were discussing earlier. That I don't believe are demons. It's just they're not too concerned with us, so it's easy to perceive them as being negative. But I myself do not believe in in negative and evil spirits. And I know that um, a, a lot of what Darkness Radio reports on, and what I like what you guys do, Dave, is you don't say, this is a devil. You say, this is the evidence, and you guys put it out there. You have the guests on, and there are people who disagree with me, and that's fine. It's all about free speech. We're allowed to have different opinions and let the audience decide for themselves. Let them find what their truth is. I like the sound of that. Let's uh, let's wrap up with one more Parish air, and this guy also sends us a great uh, news story for the week, and then we'll roll into supernatural news. And Tim is still down. Mark, he's just having a hard time breathing and even speaking. So, would you mind hanging in with me for a little bit on supernatural news? It'd be my pleasure. All right, let's uh, wrap up our parish air with this story from Jake. Hi, Tim and Dave. See what I did there? Yeah, I see Jake. It's Dave and Tim. Don't forget it, Dave and Tim. Anyway, when I was about 16, I lived with my mom and sister for the most part or spent time bouncing from friends' houses to friends' houses. My dad passed away previously when I was 14. We moved around a lot after he died. We landed in this old diner that had been converted in, uh, to almost a studio-style apartment. With the exception of my mom's room and the restrooms, nothing else was closed off, really. My room had a dividing wall and a doorway, but no doors. It used to be a dining area when it was a restaurant. My mom had a boyfriend that stayed over from time to time. He was a big guy, built like a WWE's The Undertaker. The guy was huge. Anyway, I remember after being there for a few months, weird stuff started happening. My mom had uh, a wind-up porcelain doll, and that creepy thing would just start playing on its own out of nowhere. Our microwave started turning on by itself, and we would all be in what was the living room and hear this distinctive beeping. And then the microwave would just come on, like someone or something pressed start. One time I went in there because I heard the beeping over and over. Beep, beep, beep. Then again, beep, beep, beep. I went to check out the microwave. Door had been left open, but something was pressing the buttons to set the time. Six, six, Six. Then another Mm. beep, trying to start it, but the door was open, Dave and Tim. I like that better. And this was just getting pissed. With me standing there, beep, 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 faster and more furious. And then another six, 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 then a beep. It would clear, then nine, 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 beep, then six, six, six. And it just continued. I unplugged the damn microwave, guys. That damn thing. And that damn doll started playing on its own, and I felt a chill. I got the F out of there. Well, I hope you got the E and the G out of there, too, because you don't want to leave them behind. About a week passed, and I had been with uh, out with some buddies. 
When I came home on a Sunday, everyone was kind of on edge. My sister had been sleeping on the couch the night before when she awoke to what she thought was someone whispering in her ear. She said it was in French, but I wondered later if maybe it was Latin. She opened her eyes and saw a fairly tall man with a bald head and a huge beard standing in the door to my room, staring at her, moving his lips as if he were speaking. He was about 20 feet away from her, and uh, she said it's as if he was whispering it right to her. She freaked out. She pounded on the door to my mom's room, and Dan, my mom's boyfriend, leapt out of bed to the other uh, room to chase the intruder, but he was already gone. They tried to console my sister, but it took a couple of days. About a month went by, and we had gotten uh, used to the microwave and the doll noise, but no other sightings had happened yet. One day after school, I was in the recliner reading a book. My mom and sister were on the computer in my mom's room doing homework or something. It was early evening, not quite dusk. And uh, the best I can figure is I fell asleep reading. Then I heard it, someone whispering in my ear. Now, my first thought was that it had to be friends of mine who came in unnoticed. They all heard the ghost story, but as I tried to get up and turn to look, I realized I couldn't move. I felt a weight on me that I couldn't shake. Then it happened. I felt hands slip around my throat, tightening, cutting off the blood first, then my airway. I felt my face growing hot. I tried to call for help, but it's as if I were a million miles away. Guys, I'm a big man, and at this time in high school, I was about 210 pounds. I don't scare easy, and I'm stout. Nobody can hold me down where I can't move. But this was different. I couldn't move a muscle. I was able to move my eyes and scanned left to right. On the table stand by the recliner was a TV remote, a cup of tea, and a jar of my sister's black finger nail polish shaped like a ball. It was a decent size and made of very heavy glass. I mustered everything I could, got my left arm to move. I was straining. I reached over, grabbed the heavy-duty nail polish jar, and launched it behind my head at whatever was there. And all at once, I was able to gasp in the air and jumped up. Now, I never heard the polish hit the concrete floor, and I, as I jumped up to turn around, nobody was there. Slowly, sound started to return. I could hear the cars and the dogs outside. I could hear my mom and sister in the next room, but no broken glass, no nail polish to clean up. I went to the next room, and when asked if uh, they heard me struggling, they said they hadn't heard something but thought I was talking in my sleep. For two months, my sister complained about not finding that nail polish. I have since learned of sleep paralysis, and it fits the narrative of what happened, and it's happened a couple of times since, although the choking feeling and lack of mobility, but I can't explain away the whispers or the missing nail polish. It's like something caught it and took it to another dimension. Anyway, minor sightings continued till we moved, but mostly shadows in the mirror across the doorway. The microwave and doll continued their annoyances as well. My other sleep paralysis style episodes happen about four or five more times over the next couple of years, but that was without the whispers and no missing items. Thanks, guys. Keep up the great shows, and please do a True Crime Tuesday episode on Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. And that comes from Jake in Texas. Jake, thanks for sharing your story with us, and thank you for the new story. We'll cover that in the next segment. That's a lot of activity to take place, and we do know about the... Um, the whole deal with sleep paralysis. We understand how that works, Mark, but what about the whispers and the clutching feeling around the neck? I think that's um, symptomatic of uh, of sleep paralysis as well. In fact, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who teaches psychology at a local university, and we had a, a very in-depth discussion about that. So sleep paralysis is where you know you feel like you cannot move whatsoever and of course as he said he was able to at some point muster the strength to resist this thing um what i would like to do is to get a a, a paranormal investigation team a legitimate one um like you know like one that would consist of like you dave jeff blanger uh me and uh, <laughs> i think that's the first time else. in his history anybody said jeff blanger and dave schrader and legitimate in the same sentence mark well, well you done. guys are i mean well you know i, I know you guys both of you I know. well enough is 
what it is, people think because um, when we're on stage that we're funny and, you know, we clown around and all that, that somehow there's not a seriousness to our nature. You know, and I've, I've, I know a lot of celebrities and I know a lot of professional comedians and behind the ha ha ha, there tends to be um, high intellect and and a very serious nature. You know, it's just one facet of us. Because I, I would like to examine that place, uh, see what there is, um, because to me it looks a lot like sleep paralysis. No, I can't explain away the fingernail polish, but then again, we have to uh, clinically uh, analyze the entire scene, interview the people, and see what type of activity, if any, is actually occurring there. That's a good point. Hold tight. We'll be back with some supernatural news and Mark Anthony, our guest, right after this. Beyond the darkness. Welcome back to the Best in Paranormal Talk Radio. This is Beyond the Darkness. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. Joining me today, the one and only Mark Anthony. And uh, we've had a lot of time with, a lot of fun time with our Parashare segment today. Uh, Mark is the psychic lawyer and the psychic explorer. You can find information of him, for him and about him and all of his books, his media, all of that, and how you can get telephone readings or in-person readings by visiting his website, Evidence of Eternity. Dot com. That's evidenceofeternity.com. And he has graciously agreed to hang in with me as we do some supernatural news. Timmy D is out today, sicker than a dog. Keep you, keep him in your thoughts and prayers if you don't mind. All right. We've got some uh, interesting supernatural news for the week. Are you ready to, to dive in headlong? I oh, can't wait. This oh. is going to be great. <laughs> just, I just, you're going to love just the headlines on this one. We're going to Colorado for our very first story here, Mark, where a hunter claims he was sexually assaulted by a Sasquatch. <laughs> first Hollywood, first Hollywood and now the, the woods of, of Colorado. Apparently you're, you're nowhere as immune from sexual harassment. Daryl Whitaker from Glenwood Springs in Colorado claims that a Sasquatch attacked him and attempted to rape him while he was walking in the woods. That's what the 57-year-old man was walking to his hunting cabin on Sunday to see if it had suffered any damage during the winter. All of a sudden, a large gorilla-like creature dropped from a tree in front of him, punched him in the face. It was at least eight feet tall. Its punches hurt like hell. I was knocked right out on the first blow. While Mr. Whitaker was trying to recover from the attack, the large humanoid creature began to tear his clothes while letting out some terrifying howls. When I regained consciousness, he had already torn my pants and was tearing through my underwear. I stabbed him in the shoulder with my hunting knife, and that made him run away. Mr. Whitaker immediately reported the attack to both the Glenwood Springs Police Department and the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Agency, and a joint investigation has been launched. Daryl Whitaker is convinced that the creature who attacked him was a Sasquatch, but the GSPD investigators say it's more probable the attacker is simply a particularly large and hairy man. <laughs> they are currently interrogating nearby residents to see if anyone noticed an individual corresponding to the description of the suspect. According to the victim, the attacker measured around 8 feet tall, is extremely hairy, he has brown hair, brown, dark eyes, and extremely large feet. If you possess any information concerning the suspect, please contact the Glenwood Springs Police Department or the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Agency. I would say also, if you see a tall, hairy man with a recent stab wound to his shoulder, that might be a good indication that you've got your uh, your guy as well. Look at that, Mark. Sasqu Can you sue Sasquatch for uh, violating you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what it is in Colorado, but I know in Florida that if you're attacked by a wild animal, um, which could be anything from an alligator to a rat, that the premises owner is not responsible. So first off, we'd have to determine if a Sasquatch, number one, exists, number two, is a wild animal, <laughs> and number three, let's look at the evidence here. Okay. Um, so he stabbed this creature, so that therefore would indicate that there would be blood on the knife or at the scene of the ah, alleged. Ah, look at yes. you, science man. Yeah. yeah, so why aren't we DNA typing this? Because it could be um, large 
furry man that this guy doesn't want his wife to know that he's messing around with in the woods. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> or, gee, this blood sample, the DNA on it doesn't match any human DNA, nor does it match any animals on record. So let's start there. Okay. Um, secondly, let's get a whole psychological profile on this guy to see that he doesn't suffer from any type of uh, delusions. Come so on, me- Mark. Stop with your science. Well, you know, <laughs> hey, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Once you remove the impossible, you have the um, you you have the result, no matter how improbable. Right. So. <laughs> so you know, it's it's an interesting story that he was you know uh, molested by by Sasquatch, um, but I would want to look over all the the evidence first. And even the cops are saying it's more likely a big hairy man. Everybody okay. loves somebody sometimes, sometimes. right? Yes. And as we you know say it in in the criminal field at the time of the alleged rape, right? <laughs> yeah, and more or importantly, maybe, and more importantly, Harvey was the hunter asking for it? Or maybe Harvey Weinstein is now living in the mountains of Colorado. <laughs> could be. You know, he's he's been away from people he could, you know, anyway. We'll Empower, like right. Let's, uh, let's talk about some entertainment news. Dancing on Ice 2018 is haunted. Holly Willoughby's horror as a ghostly studio is uh, sighting has been revealed. Dancing on Ice is experiencing paranormal activity as the studio is haunted by a creepy presence, leaving audience goers in fear. Well, that's according to the reports. The show moved to a base at Bovingdon Airfield in Hemel Hempstead, which is filled with derelict buildings and has been home to a number of unexplained incidents over the years. Several visitors to the area have been left terrified by a mysterious mist that follows and engulfs people. The area was so uh, was also investigated by the International Paranormal Society, who believe the place is haunted by the ghosts of U.S. airmen who are stationed there. An entry on waymarking location reveals uh, review reveals the mist has been seen by several people. Uh, they say it suddenly appears and is so thick you can't see through it. One person is rumored to have seen it late at night on the runway. The insider continued that the mist even followed and engulfed a group of friends. Some friends of his uh, were waiting in a car six meters away, and they said it followed him. It was engulfing him, they explained. Uh, the victim found that he could not see through the mist to the car, nor could he hear his companion's calling out to him. In another incident, one driver saw another vehicle get engulfed in the mist. Dog walkers have also reported a presence that causes their animals to howl and try to run away. Other passerbys have claimed to hear the sounds of aircraft and Morse code along with a strange bubblegum smell. Boy, at least they smell good. Rumors are rife that the U.S. Air Force left vehicles abandoned in an underground chamber at the site. Those who work on the show now fear that a paranormal incident could happen while live on air. And it's, oh yeah, they're really fearful of that. They're drawing all this attention to it. Maybe they want people to tune in in hopes that paranormal will be captured on the air, Mark. Um, an insider said it's likely many of the contestants and professional skaters have no idea they're performing somewhere that's rumored to be haunted. If the claims are to be believed, there's a good chance something could happen during rehearsals or even while the show is on the air. Now, does that see? I don't mean to be cynical. Does that seem like maybe they're just looking for an extra push to get people to check out Dancing on Ice? Oh, if ticket sales aren't soaring. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, I guess it's like Dancing with the Stars. It's a TV series out there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, I'll tell you what. Um, Okay, maybe there's a paranormal thing going on there, but if it isn't, this is genius marketing 101. Sure is. Okay, because even, oh, patrons are scared. Come on, fear sells. I mean, you and I have been at all these haunted locations, and when we announce that there's a ghost hunt, folks are lining up. They want to buy the tickets because people want to come into contact with the other worldly. So um, I'd say it's a win-win situation. If it is a paranormal phenomenon and they catch it on film, fantastic. And if it's not, hey, ticket sales and ratings are going to be great. Well, you know what that reminds me of? And I don't know if you remember this point in our history, but um, when the movie Three Men and a Baby came out, it was huge. Yes. And as I remember, the video sales blew it up even further. And that was back in the day when you had to spend like five bucks to rent a video. 
uh, it blew up because there was the story of the ghost. They had filmed in this old apartment building where a child had died during a fire. And during one of the scenes, you see the two characters walk past the window and there's nothing there. And then they immediately walk past it the other direction. And you can see very clearly this young boy standing in the window staring at them. I remember that. But, oh, that was great. Right. But. And people ran out and rented it like crazy. And this was a legend and a big story. You can go check it out. We all did. And I'm sure that part on most old videotapes is worn out from people checking it out. It's when one of the, I think it's um, Gutenberg's mom or Ted Danson's mom comes to visit and she wants to see the baby and they go walking past and then pick up the baby and come back. First of all, um, that was huge. Everybody was talking about it. The rentals went through the roof. It was great marketing ploy. But what we only found out, I think, like within the last 20 years here, so, you know, almost 30 years after the movie came out, was the fact that um, it was a cardboard cutout of Ted Danson from an earlier scene that wasn't used. And somebody had thrown it back there as part of the prop. And they had filmed those, the walking in scene and the leaving scene at two different times. And people are like, oh, you're crazy. It's a ghost. Well, they, if you go online and look, you can see the side by side comparison of the cardboard cutout of Ted Danson and the side by side of the, um, uh, scene. And there's no doubt that it is that cardboard cutout that just got left behind in one of the scenes. Then to tack it on, they didn't film in a real apartment. They filmed on a sound stage. So there was no haunted apartment complex that they used for that. But man, did that drive business up? Holy cow. There are still people that will watch it and swear by the fact that it's a ghost. So I might have just helped to push that sales or rental code back up again for three men and a baby. Well, it's, it's, um, like when they found the wooden prop of the Loch Ness monster at the bottom of Loch Ness. Right. And it was from a movie in the 1950s. I mean, I, I was crushed because, uh, I remember when I went to Loch Ness, uh, I was, a uh, I was, um, just in law school when I was going to Oxford, we took a weekend and went up to Inverness and to Loch Ness and we're looking for a monster. And then all the locals were like, I hope they don't find it. It's good for business. And, and I even, you know, bought a little decanter of scotch whiskey that looked like a Loch Ness monster, which I don't know. I drank and lost somewhere <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh you know people it's it's the mystery the history and so then um last year i was on tour in new york city and i actually had a day off so i went to the museum of natural history and then they had the plesiosaurs which if there is a loch ness monster this is what it would be and i was uh, examining one of the skeletons and one of the the docents came up and he was great because he was also um a paleontologist and we started talking about this he said yeah that famous 1950s picture he said this creature could not configure its its neck that way because there's no possibility so it could move like side to side a little bit up and down but that you know monster standing up like with its you know you know what i'm talking about the way it's right. heads you know so he goes there is no way that this particular creature would be have been able to do that so it was like wow disappointed yet again through the evidence but uh hey part of me still thinks there's something <laughs> yeah no doubt about it uh let's dabble with a few more stories here Kate Katie Price has been forced to call ghost hunters after a shadowy figure is haunting her family. Katie Price has been forced to call in a top ghost hunter after years of hauntings inside her Sussex mansion. The loose woman starlet has been complaining about hauntings in her home for a long time and has now sought out professional help. Katie Price, 39, invited Lee Roberts, one of the UK's leading paranormal investigators, to her home to show her exactly how ghost hunting works. Now, Lee has revealed he's shown the former Glamour model how to use specialist equipment to track spooks and wants to take her on more ghost hunts. He told the son, Kate, Katie is very much into ghost hunting and the paranormal, and we uh, have been messaging for a couple of months on Twitter, so we just want to explore it a little more. And... uh she says here, Lee explained he had been showing her how he does his job and told the publication that they haven't performed a full investigation inside Katie's home, but have looked at which experiments and equipment they should use. He added, she's had things in the past that were moving. The family has seen shadows. We were using it to see if it was picking anything up. She's had bits and bobs of paranormal activity over the years. Lee, who has worked on most haunted live events and U.S. TV show Ghost Attacks, revealed the pair are headed to other haunted locations so Katie can get more of an experience. 
Uh, it doesn't sound like she's so frightened of it if she's willing to go to more. The professional ghost hunter also insisted that the duo are not filming for a TV show, but wouldn't rule out accepting an offer if producers were keen. Katie has previously been open about her problem with poltergeists in her house and previously called in mediums for help. During an episode of Loose Women last year, she revealed a psychic told her that ghouls are attracted to her aura. And she suffered from paranormal activity for 20 years. She said, most of my houses are haunted. When I've had mediums around, they say, it's me. I have an aura around me. Now, that's an interesting aspect. The starlet also had her home cleared, but the hauntings have continued. Well, that would lead you to believe, right? It's not the location. It's the person Katie explained, we had it cleared because it was haunted and we had to get rid of the ghosts. The kids would sometimes scream in the night. On one occasion, I heard Junior screaming, help, help, in the middle of the night. And I went up to see him and he said he'd seen someone outside. Just last year, Katie shared a video to her official Katie Price Instagram account where she tried to communicate with the spirits using a candle. Yeah, we're we're not filming for a TV show, but we're open to the idea. Here's another self-promotion tool. Uh, But it's interesting to see anyway. I mean, right? I mean, you've got somebody who believes that they're going in, but it it does sound like she's more haunted, right, than the the house itself. I guess the name of the show could be It's Not You, It's Me. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Which definitely seems to be the case yeah, here. You, we are not pitching a show. No, however, however, if your producer in charge of development happens, our our telephone number is five 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 five. Yeah. Um. I uh, once again, I think that that that's great publicity and promotion, and the idea that the house isn't haunted. I am so follow me around so um, freaky things can happen. Well, I understand um, that aspect of it, but I'm just saying in reality, Mark. I mean, it's more likely that people are are haunted than a location is, right? I mean, wouldn't we be, wouldn't spirits be more attracted to us and hanging out and, and kind of being part of our energy? As you said, energy is energy and it, attra- you know, like attracts alike. Wouldn't we maybe draw that energy to us? Well, there's a lot of people close to me, uh, personally and professionally who would say when Mark's around, weird things happen. <laughs> um, and they would be right. So, you know, it's fun to, to, you know, to tease her and all that, but it's entirely possible that she may be very spiritually sensitive and she doesn't really know how to use it or work with it yet because she hasn't been disciplined. And so, yeah, she does pick up on things. It doesn't mean she's haunted. It means she's perceiving spirits, you know, because wherever I go, um, people that that are open to this they always say strange things happen when i'm around you know weird electrical phenomenon or they start picking up on things or i start seeing things and it's because i'm i'm you know i am a medium and i am open to this but i don't fear it because i work with it and i have an understanding and to me the way to cure fear is through understanding um it's like it's like all the, the xenophobia, the, the hating people from certain countries and places because they are different. They look different. They believe different. If you don't understand something, you fear it. If you fear it, therefore, it is evil. So, you know, I, I think that if she worked with it, um, and perhaps a medium like me on their TV show. Um, not that you're looking for a show, but not, you're not open that to I'm the idea. Not for a TV show, <laughs> but um, it, it would also um, cure, cure the fear factor involved with that as well. Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, are you familiar with them? They did Shaun of the Dead and um, Paul, the movie about the alien and At the World's End. Have you seen that, that series of movies? Yes, I did. Um, I, I, I have. And Simon Pegg, wasn't he? Um, he's Mr. Scott on the new Mr. Star Trek. Scott. Yeah. And he was also in Lord of the Rings. Um, I know. I've was... never seen that. I, I draw the nerd line right there. I have not okay, seen the Lord well, of the Rings movies. Oh, I th- you would like it. You would like especially the first one. The Fellowship's really good. The whole light, dark spirituality thing. Anyway. Um, but, uh, yeah, Simon Pegg, a uh, big fan. I'm well, big fan. comedy favorites Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are set out to collaborate once again on a brand new horror comedy TV series. Returning to the medium they started out in with shows such as Spaced, uh, the Shaun of the Dead team are now working on a new show called Truth Seekers. Made under their new banner, Stolen Picture, the show will feature and follow a three-person paranormal investigation team, and each episode will focus on different paranormal incidents 
that they investigate. Uh, each episode is going to be an adventure, a potential haunting or something, Peg told Variety. It'll start as a very parochial idea, a very small business venture for these people, but it will expand as the series goes on to be something far more global. It's a language everybody understands, the mystery of the unknown. Shaun of the Dead was a very parochial story set in northern uh, London, and somehow it managed to get this global reach because everyone understands the language of zombie movies. This isn't the only project in the work for Peg and Frost's new company either, as the movie Slaughterhouse Rules was announced in May of last year. They're also working on a movie about a fading double act who haven't spoken in decades but reunite one last time. We'd like to do it as a two-hander and make it on a very low budget, Peg explained. We've had the idea for a long time and we're going to write it and outline it and then improvise and make something, which is far looser than when we work with Edgar Wright, where every transition is so precise. As well as Shaun of the Dead, the pair have also made a number of other comedy classics, such as Hot Fuzz and The World's End, and have gone to Hollywood success. However, Frost explained that they're happy to make lower budget work again to retain creative control, adding, there's the trade-off. I'd rather have a lot less money and make a film or TV series and have a great time doing it than put it through a million processes and people you don't know and you don't respect creatively. I'd love to see them do a TV series. I think that'll be a lot of fun. Although I kind of feel like jumping on the ghost hunting bandwagon may be about five years too late. Well, you know, trends in Hollywood. I mean, World War II is hot again. I mean, you know, you've had Dunkirk. you got the, the film with uh, Gary Oldman about right. Churchill. Right. Uh, you got a couple other ones out there. Westerns uh, are having a resurgence. So there's always going to be a place for the paranormal because, uh, as you and I know, the paranormal is actually normal. Well, we've got another story coming out of the U.K. Search for real-life Ghostbusters as spooky sightings are beginning to soar. There are so many spooks in Britain that a massive recruitment drive is underway for Ghostbusters. Paranormal robbers, or I'm sorry, robbers, paranormal probers (laughs) are trying to bolster numbers to help monitor the growing number of phantom goings-on. Top ghost hunter uh, Eddie Brazil said the industry needs a shot in the arm after years of dwindling numbers, even though ghostly events seem to be booming. UK ghost hunters in Nottingham have launched an online appeal for more volunteer paranormal investigators. Their Facebook ad, which features a picture of a ghost, reads, UKGH are looking to expand their team of investigators Do you have what it takes? Paranormal investigator Eddie from High Wycombe Bucks said activity peaked when TV's Most Haunted was originally broadcast. He said when Most Haunted was on, ghost hunting was in vogue. All of a sudden, the interest dropped out of it. Eddie, age 61, works with fellow ghost hunter Paul Adams. They've written several books, including Extreme Hauntings and The Borley Rectory Companion. This week, a creepy appearance in a hen's party group, which I think means like a bridal shower, right? Yeah. Yeah, a hen's party group left the girls so petrified they reportedly ended their trip and fled home. And it is an interesting picture because you've got all of these hens, as they call them, all the the bridal shower people, all cheering and smiling and off behind them, kind of creeping in below a log as this little kid looking up at them. Uh, the pals posed for two pictures with their arms around each other and holding up masks beside a lake while on a hen do, while on a hen do, I guess that means while on one of these little retreats for the uh, bachelorette party, um, on the remote estate Argyle and Butte, Scotland. The, uh, first picture came out normal, but in the second picture, a little boy can be seen crouching behind a log next to one of the women. And it is pretty clear. I mean, that's, I, I would say my only fear is that it looks disproportionate, so it could be one of those ghost capture apps. But, uh, again, you know, I, I don't know the perspective of how this picture was taken, when, where, or how, or who, who the people are behind it. But it's certainly an interesting-looking shot. Um, have you been to uh, Scotland to investigate or, or, or be around any of the hauntings, Mark? Well, I've been in Scotland. It wasn't on investigation, but let me tell you, that place is is chock full of uh, spiritual energy. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I spent a lot of time at Loch Ness, and then I was at a couple of castles in Edinburgh, Aberdeen, and then there was one I can't remember the name, but it was like right out of like a Braveheart. It was like you had to take this path that's on this cliff, and it's <laughs> built out. I mean, it was like really cool, yeah. you know. And uh, you always feel stuff out there. And and as we we've, we've discussed, it's like matter retains energy and vibration. So I mean, castles. 
you know, we romanticized them, but they were military forts, and I would say most, if not all of them, um, there were some type of battle, struggle, executions, people dying there. So you're going to pick up on something for sure. We've got uh, an interesting story, and first of all, I want to mention, talking about haunted castles, our team is, uh, our Darkness Radio Show, we're going to do another event in Romania in um, September of 2018. We'd love for you listeners to join us. We're already half sold out. We've got almost 20 people uh, signed up and ready to go on this, and it is amazing. First of all, Romania is one of the most beautiful places on earth. If I could retire anywhere in the world right now, I would go to Romania. First of all, our dollar is very strong there. It's worth about three of their dollars. But the the culture, the landscape, everything is gorgeous and so wrought with history. We're going to follow in the footsteps of Dracula, Vlad the Impaler. We're going to start in the haunted Baisu Forest, which also not only haunted, but has a well known has been a well known UFO hotspot. And we're going to get to investigate it at night. We're going to be hitting four castles associated with Vlad the Impaler, from where he grew up to where he lived to where he was imprisoned and more. Plus, we get to investigate two castles while we're on the trip. A full investigation. Uh, we get to visit haunted citadels, churches, hotels. It's going to be amazing. This will be my third trip to Romania. It's been five years since we've been there. And people have been begging for us to do a new Dracula tour. So if you're interested, check out darknessevents.com. That's darknessevents.com. Or Darkness Radio. Uh, email me at dave at darknessradio.com, and I'll send you the link to go check up and sign up. You can sign up now and put down a deposit and make a few payments to make it affordable to you. But this is one of our best trips. I'm so psyched and excited to be going back, and uh, it's going to be a great time. So check it out for yourself. But the reason I was asking about Scotland, Mark, is that um, – this uh, author of this article, David McLean, is posing the question, are the Southbridge vaults the most haunted place in Ed- Edinburgh? Edinburgh is world famous as a hotbed of paranormal activity, which begs the question, where is the city's most haunted location? Some say it's the Southbridge vaults. Hidden from view beneath Edinburgh's bustling South Bridge lies an ancient network of vaults, storage areas, and more. And uh, I don't know if you've been to the vaults, but the vaults are really active. We've caught some really cool stuff while we've been out there. South Bridge lies in an ancient network of vaults, storage areas constructed in the late 18th century. From the outset, the vaults and the bridge were regarded as cursed. When South Bridge was completed back in 1788, it had been intended for the city's oldest resident to make the first official crossing. Unfortunately, she died immediately prior to the opening and her coffin was the first thing to cross the bridge instead. A superstition arose that the bridge was cursed as a result and many Edinburgh's uh, refused to cross over it. At their inception, the vaults were intended to be used as storerooms and also housed taverns, cobblers, and a distillery and other trades. The businesses soon abandoned the vaults, though, due to their lack of light, being damp, and just being insanitary. This did not deter Edinburgh's poorest residents, however, and the vaults soon became home to the most desperate in society. The vaults also became a den of vice and nefarious practices. In some vaults, there would be up to 15 people residing there in the damp with scant access to light and ventilation. It is estimated that dozens of men and women and children succumbed to disease in these vaults and met their end while attempting to live within its harsh environment. In the early 19th century, some claims that the vaults were frequented by Burke and Hare, who would prowl the dark chambers in search for fresh fresh bodies to pinch. They were two of the most famous body um, thieves, and they would sell the bodies, sell the things. It's really a crazy story. Look up Burke and Hare. As a matter of fact, Simon Pegg did a TV series about that. The vaults were eventually blocked up and forgotten about, but in the late 1980s, they were sensationally rediscovered by former Scotland rugby internationalist Nori Rowan, who spent a number of years tirelessly excavating them. Today, Nori Rowan operates a nightclub and bar within a section of the vaults, but other parts have become frequented by ghost tour companies, many of them claiming that it is the capital's most haunted location. But how much truth is there in that statement? Dark, cramped, ancient, the vaults are certainly spooky looking. Of that, there's no argument, and there have been literally hundreds of alleged ghost sightings and paranormal happenings down there over the years, some of them conducting during the tours. Uh, paranormal experts say the South Bridge vaults is one of the most haunted places in the UK on account of the sheer number of disturbances recorded there, which include voices and full apparitions. Some visitors of the vaults have even reported physical contact, usually in the form of scratches and bruises to the skin. 
In 2003, BBC Radio Scotland producer Debbie McPhail was speaking to Nori Rowan in the vaults only to discover that the recording they had made was unusable due to a mysterious voice speaking in Gaelic. Colleagues who played it back claim it sounded like a voice saying, get out or go away. Mrs. McPhail said at the time, I'm a cynical person by nature, especially about this sort of thing, but I just don't have any explanation for this. And in 2006, the Erie Vaults attracted the attention of the hit TV show Most Haunted, hosted by Yvette Fielding. The Most Haunted team investigated the vaults on two occasions, claiming it was home to a myriad of supernatural occurrences that defy explanation. Other TV shows, such as Ghost Adventures and Joe Swash Believes in Ghosts, have taken an interest, too. According to the City of the Dead Tours, who ran nightly tours into the legendary labyrinth, the vaults are as black as Satan's jammies, which are stalked by a malevolent presence known as the Southbridge Entity, which some call the Watcher. Back in 2015, tourist Emma Surgener was petrified after visiting the vaults when a photo appeared to show the Watcher standing behind her. The story was picked up by the UK National Press with experts unable to explain the phenomena that appeared in the image. If even half of the numerous ghost stories are to be believed, then the Southbridge vaults should be considered among the most haunted places in Europe, if not the world. That's a cool story. Boy, that's crazy activity when you've got that many people seeing that many things, which leads us into our next story. I'm sure you've been hearing about this, Mark. Was Michigan Meteor really a UFO or missile? A shock claims explosion over uh, over Michigan. A bright meteor, which was said to have exploded over Michigan, has sparked frantic speculation that it was actually a UFO or a missile. On Tuesday of last week, a bright meteor briefly swept across the sky over parts of the U.S. Midwest and Canada, which caused a powerful explosion rattling homes and astonishing onlookers. The official explanation from experts such as NASA was that a meteor had entered Earth's atmosphere and burnt up upon arrival. However, have sensationally claimed there is something more sinister going on. Paranormal YouTube channel Secure Team 10 posted a video on its page titled, What Really Just Happened Over Michigan? The narrator of the video says he has been inundated with pictures of a strange red beam, which was seen in the skies over Michigan, which was uh, that was seen when the meteor struck. He goes on to ask, what is that beam of light? What is the fire? Does it have something to do with this meteor? Something strange, it seems to have happened over Michigan. I don't know what, but I'm still trying to get the details. Um, and uh, commenters on the video have, have given their theories ranging from alien activity to weaponry, which I don't know if you've seen the video. It's pretty intriguing, and you see this thing come down and hit. Um, and a lot of people are really interested because there's really no proof of Nobody's been able to find much of the debris, which is interesting because uh, you've got a lot of hunters out there searching for it. Um, there's all this questioning of did we just blow something out of the sky using like a Tesla death ray? Yeah, I well, I've seen I've seen the footage, and I'm very intrigued with this. And it could be a meteor, okay? And maybe they didn't find the debris because it burned up, or maybe it hit a body of water, and they don't know yet. It could be weaponry, which could have exploded, um, or it could have been a, a UFO. And the thing that that always that I go back to whenever there's this, oh, it's a meteor or, oh, it's a weather balloon. My father was involved in the aerospace industry, and he was there from the get-go, from the the Gemini, the Mercury. He worked with Chuck Yeager on the X-15. And I'll never forget, he had a top-secret security clearance at the Pentagon. He told me that... In the the 1950s, he was in a lab in California, and he saw them growing silicon chips. And he said, where did we get the idea to do this? And one of the the, uh, lead engineers said, well, something happened in New Mexico in the late 40s. Something crashed, and it was covered up as uh, as a weather balloon, he says, and it gave us ideas. And what had happened was the U.S. military brought in every – electrical um they brought in um uh, texas instrument they brought in ge they brought in morton thiokol uh they brought in 
uh, reaction motor, and they all examined this. So clearly he was referring to the Roswell incident. And Dad said that gave us ideas because within a few years of Roswell, we went from using tubes and uh, very primitive electrical um, uh, conductors to transistors. And he said the transistor was the biggest leap in electronics uh, um, technology and, and the biggest advancement since Edison's laboratories invented the light bulb. And, so, and then silicon chips were the greatest leap in technology from that. And if you think about it, it's because of silicon chips, which led Steve Jobs and and uh, the, the Apple II team and all that, and uh, the Bill Gates uh, organizations into creating these, these computers that we're now using. So I never rule out... Um, aliens visiting this planet. Uh, I was talking to somebody from New York City. Of course, she knows everything. And she says, oh, well, there's aliens, but they haven't visited us. It's like, well, I didn't realize this is in, in the same room with the supreme pinnacle of intelligence in the <laughs> multiverses. You know, <laughs> so, so yeah, I, I saw that footage and it looks very strange. And I've seen plenty of meteors and I've seen plenty of rocket launches and I've always always had my finger on the pulse of of what at least they're releasing to us about space technology. That leads us into one of our final two stories, um, which I, I love this headline. Uh, two airmen involved in the British Roswell may have been abducted by aliens when they went to investigate lights from a UFO in Woodland. That's what retired USAF colonel claims in newly released footage. The U.S. Air Force colonel was recorded saying he believes two men involved in the Rendlesham Forest incident considered the British Roswell were perhaps abducted by aliens. Video recently released shows Charles Halt saying he believes one of the two men, John Burroughs, may have been abducted and admitting that both Burroughs and Jim Penniston were unaccounted for for hours. Halt, who is now retired, was discussing the December 26, 1980 event in which Staff Sergeant Penniston and Airman Burroughs reportedly interacted with a small aircraft that landed in Rendlesham Forest near the NATO airbase of RAF Woodbridge and RAF Bentwaters in Suffolk, England. Halt was working as a deputy commander in the U.S. Army at the time. Halt, in his original memo to the U.K.'s Ministry of Defense, did not mention his thoughts thoughts that have now been revealed by former police detective Gary Heseltine, who, along with his wife, Lynn, is making a documentary about the incident. The video was shot by Lynn in 2010 and shows her husband walking and talking with Halt about the incident. Um, I had a chance to go out there. It was amazing just to be on that site. And the notion that Burroughs and Penniston were abducted by the unidentified flying object had been widespread. Halt became involved on December 28th, 1980, when he returned to the area of Rendlesham Forest where the Burroughs and Penniston claimed to have seen the aircraft. He allegedly saw a light beam from the aircraft. One witness told The Sun in December of 2016, I could see these lights over the treetops, and I was thinking, what's going on? Then they started sending people out there, and at first it was hard to believe all these bright lights. It was hard to take in. The UK's Ministry of Defense dismissed the incident. The incident is now called the British Roswell after the famous alleged UFO sighting in Roswell, New Mexico. John Burroughs may have been abducted. Who knows? The footage shows Halt saying, I don't play up to that. He adds, you know, there's a lot of lost time. We know that. And uh, they were not on the radio. It's a, it's a crazy place, Mark. Have you ever been to the site of the Rendlesham Forest uh, crash? No, and and that's on my. That's definitely on my to do list. I, I was lucky um, enough to see it twice this last year on my two different British invasion tours, and it is so cool that you get to go right there to that site. Wait right there. You can walk through this historic walk where they show you all the highlights. Here's the gate where they received the call. Here's where they they stood when they saw this. Here's where they stood when they saw that, and then you can go right to the exact clearing where this craft was brought or where this craft clearly. landed. Aliens are not perfect because if they crash, you know, we tend to think that, oh, aliens are going to be, you know, just you know, as sharp as can be. But uh, perhaps when they get here and you got to – I mean, all right, let's assume that, that all this is true, which I, which I, I believe. Um, it's a harrowing distance. I mean, these, these beings are coming from light years away. So obviously they have exceeded um, – 
our understanding of quantum physics. But even even Einstein said that space curves and bends. So perhaps they're able to find you know a bend to make what we would think would be a um, hundred light years. Maybe it could be a fraction of that. So they get here, and it's got to be very taxing on whatever type of technology they have. And then they're encountering an alien planet, unfamiliar with the gravitational field, and there's room for error. Ergo crashes. So that being the case, it is fascinating to think that we are being uh, visited by beings who are not gods and who are not perfect, but are flawed like we are. It's just a different level of technology. I think this is pretty cool stuff. I agree. Very interesting. And our last story is an Arizona family haunted. The This article originally appeared in Yiddish Forverts magazine. An Arizona family is haunted by a Yiddish speaking ghost. Usually reports of alleged paranormal events feature people who suspect that their house is haunted or they believe they've seen a UFO or received a signal from a long deceased relative. Rarely, however, is the main focus of such a report a Yiddish word. But that's just what happened in Phoenix, Arizona, when Rudy Calderon saw an inscription on his bathroom wall in a language he couldn't read. As he explained in a Facebook post seeking help and advice, the unknown word appeared on the wall after the family had experienced several weeks of strange occurrences in their home. We've stumped as to why it's happening now, he told the website AZ Central. The reason I went to social media is because I've never experienced anything like this before. Their odyssey began when the unexplained disappearance of a miniature plush Santa Claus. Soon other objects started to vanish. When the family left to go shopping, they returned to find that all of their kitchen drawers had been thrown open, despite the fact that nobody had been in the house and its doors remained tightly locked. The Calderones suspected that they were the victims of a nasty series of pranks. Several days after the incident, when the kitchen drawers, both of the family's bathrooms simultaneously flooded. Shortly afterwards, Calderon discovered the strange inscription on the wall that someone or something had written in charcoal. After he posted a video on Facebook, someone responded that the mysterious writing was the Yiddish word for danger. Mm. Right. Since nobody in this uh, pious evangelical family knows the Hebrew alphabet, let alone Yiddish, Calderon believes that the only possible explanation is that a supernatural force is haunting his home. He's currently seeking the services of a priest to wash the walls and bless the home with holy water. Boy, I'd like a priest to come wash my floors with holy water because I've got a lot of buildup. Uh, Dr. Diane Goldstein, a professor of folklore at Indiana University who studies the ways in which Americans think about alleged paranormal incidents, told the website that such incidents are fairly widespread. She noticed, however, that this was the first time, uh, first case of which she was aware that included a Yiddish inscription. Calderon told the news site that the family hasn't called police because they don't have any hard evidence that someone had broken into the house. What would we tell the police? Things moving around, he asked. That's a good point. What do you do in that kind of case, right? You, yeah, we have something moving. Okay, good for you. <laughs> you know, they they just wouldn't care. Um, they've got enough real calls to deal with. Fascinating stuff. Mark, it's always a pleasure chatting with you, and I thank you so much for joining us today and sharing a little time on Parish Air and Supernatural News. And I know you're going to join us um, in a couple weeks on the show. We're going to talk about the ghost of Flight 401, which is a story that fascinated me since I was a kid. It's one of the first ghost stories I ever remember watching a movie about. And um, you're also going to talk to us about haunted listings and kind of the ins and outs of paranormal real estate, right? Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of things that go bump in the night, and sometimes they actually bump up property values. Interesting. Evidenceofeternity.com. That's the website to visit. Mark Anthony, the psychic lawyer. You can find more information about him, his readings, his in-person readings, telephone readings, how you can get his books, of which both have won multiple awards. So go check it out for yourself. He is one of the best in the world and has written two of the most phenomenal books you'll ever get a chance to read. So you can go check those out for yourself. And if you're looking for answers, you're looking for some comfort, um, Evidence of Eternity, Communicating with Spirits for Proof of the Afterlife is, is one I'd highly recommend. Recommend. That really helped kind of a, a nice turning point for me. And then, of course, the book Never Letting Go. Uh, that is how we were first introduced to Mark Anthony and um, heal grief with help from the other side. That's what Never Letting Go is all about. Uh, have a great rest of your uh, week, Mark. I hope you're feeling good, doing good. And I know you've got a big tour of Florida coming up. We wish you well, especially with Florida Man. We know he's always up to some kind of crazy antics. 
<laughs> I am, and uh, I'm looking forward to to um, meeting so many people in in Florida, including members of the Army of Darkness. Uh, that that I get the privilege of meeting from literally see the shining sea. So thank you, everybody, and keep tuning in to Darkness Radio. Thank you, and remember, if you guys are looking to make that connection with somebody, a loved one, somebody special, just reach out to Mark Anthony through his website and uh, book yourself a reading. Everybody I've ever sent his way has come back to me complimentary and completely blown away by what they were able to experience. So open yourself up to that. Open your heart up and give yourself the opportunity to make that same connection. That's it for this uh, day. We'll be back again tomorrow. We've got True Crime Tuesday and another edition of The Best in Paranormal Talk Radio. And remember, if you want to sign up for True Crime Tuesday, it's just as simple as this. Go to darknessradio.com darknessradio.com and click on the True Crime Tuesday banner. You can subscribe there. It's just $5 a month. And I ask that you do this. Give it a shot. You've been listening to our show for years. You want to hear True Crime Tuesday. Give us a shot because you're going to love what we're able to offer you. Four brand new 90 to 120 minute episodes a month. We talk about some of the most strange and unusual cases. Plus, we get a chance to laugh along with dumb crimes and stupid criminals. And remember, every time you subscribe that not only helps to support that show but it helps to support this show and keep us going so it goes a long way and especially with all the medical maladies tim's been dealing with every penny helps so go sign up for it right now only five dollars a month that's a buck and a quarter an episode you can't go wrong you're not going to be able to spend a buck and a quarter for more entertainment than that so go to darknessradio.com click on the true crime tuesday banner and follow along with the best in true crime every week and you can listen any day every day and go back into our archives and hear all of the past shows from the last year since we joined on Patreon. So check that out for yourself. We'll be back again tomorrow right here on Beyond the Darkness.